Hello everybody and I'm greeting you to Sustainable Human Development Lecture for Summer University course in Central European University. Today we'll speak about interesting subject, measurement of human development, measurement of sustainable human development and indicators we could use for this. You could ask why we should measure things. One famous quotation from famous statistician goes as follows. In God we trust, all others must bring data. Data help us to understand reality. Data and indicators help us to make right decision. And they help us to monitor progress and monitor development. What are the data and what are indicators? What is the difference between them? Well, basically data is a figure, is a number, which shows the status of phenomenon and this is something meaningless out of the context. That could be a number of people who get the flu during the winter. That could be number of unemployed. Out of context, it says us very few. If we go to indicators, it's typically a combination of two data sets and it helps us to show status and tendency of phenomenon. Through combination of these data sets, it put data in the context and extract meaning of, out of this data. If we say that during the winter, this winter, we got 10% more uh, people got flu, we cannot understand that it's my, a little bit bigger than previous year. But if we say it's 100% more got flu this year compared to previous year, it's clearly outbreak of flu. If we say 30% of young people are unemployed, it shows us great problem of unemployment among young population in our country. But if it's only 5% of population in general is unemployed, it says that it's not so big. To measure things, we could use qualitative and quantitative indicators, uh, which show us both sides of things. Qualitative indicators catch things in numerical way and could be very easily processed. We could compare and process them quite easily, while qualitative, qualitative things, they catch nature of things, which not so easy extractable through data. That could be example quality of education. You could say that we have such and such number of kids enrolled, but we don't know about quality of this education. What you could do, you could look on quality of curriculum, quality of teaching materials and so on. So first to get full understanding of education system in the country. We have so-called indicator-based monitoring chain, which is coming from economics and from management things. If we walk on this chain from left to right, we see things we put into something. Outputs, direct products we get out of this process. And then we have final results, outcomes and impact. When we walk on this chain, we see two important things. One important thing is on right we have important things we care about. That societal and economic and other changes we would like to see. On the other hand, it's becoming harder and harder to measure. We could measure inputs, physical or financial resources we put into process quite easily because we have full control of them. But it is rather hard and long term, -term job to measure impact, for instance, of education system, because we are not only interesting, interested in number of kids enrolled in school, which is output indicator, not only in, interested in number of kill, kids who finish, graduate the school and get the grade, which is outcome indicator, but also about their ability to work in your economy and so on and so forth. So that two things you should keep in mind when you are talking about indicators. It was a nice Saturday and I decided to go out for a small walk in mountains with my son. And I asked him, could you please have a look on web? What is weather forecast? Won't we face heavy snow during this walk? He simply googled out some map and told me, oh, it will be wonderful weather. And I asked him, where you get this? What is the source of this forecast? Could I trust it? 
And that a uh, principal question you should ask yourself when you start talking about human development data. What is the source of data? Where this figure coming from? What it mean? In principle, we could use three sources of data, three most common. First is administrative data. They are coming from administrative system or routine data. And example of this system is, for instance, vital uh, registration system, medical system with hospitals and polyclinics where people come, unemployment benefit system, and so on and so forth. So simply, this is official administrative bodies which, by, uh, which produce this data as a byproduct of their activity. Second is census data. That's an attempt to cover all units in our country and collect data from them. Third is survey data. Let's talk about each of them a little bit more. Administrative data, as I told, they are byproduct of administrative activity. That creates both positive advantages and disadvantages with this data. On one hand, it's very easy to get them. They are already in system, which means we could get this data quite quickly. At the end of each year, Social Protection Ministry reports about number of pensioners, about number of social benefits paid. So basically, we get this data with quite small lag. On the other hand, this system could be very expensive to install, but on positive side, it's very cheap to run, and it could be biased. Because from administrative data, you see only events which was captured by this system. If in your country, registration of birth is not working properly, and if part of people don't register their child until a certain age, you will have major gap in a number of birth statistical data. If your administrative system doesn't catch all mortality data and all cases of death, you will have a huge gap in this data, which could have much longer consequences for your data because from this data, from number of deaths, you calculate life expectancy at birth, which is principal indicator of uh, human development. Second are population censuses. It's an attempt to catch everything in the country, and as such, these exercises are very costly. One good example is population census, which cover, try to collect data about all population in all country. They typically run once in 10 years, but sometimes even less frequent, because it's very costly and very timely process to collect and process all this data. Less known are agricultural censuses and business censuses which collect data about agricultural units and census and um, business units in the country. Positive thing about census is that it gets practically 100% coverage of the country. That's in theory. In practice, it could be a little bit less. But they are very expensive. They are very time consuming and generally they are very rich data source that's very positive side of them and what else is very important about them they could be a source of data for other things like they could set up the base of relevant and adequate and trustworthy surveys in the country sample survey is attempt to combine positive things about censuses with limited money. So basically, it collects information about units in your country, but from limited number of units, not all as in census. That could collect data about number of household of people selected in such a way that they represent whole population of the country. Sample, sample survey are much better to, for getting human development data because they are much less expensive. They could be run quite quickly. And if they are designed appropriately, they could co collect data in very representative way and they could collect data in non-biased way, which give you quite good picture of the country.
Most known are household budget survey, which collect information about household money, about incomes, expenditures, and consumption of household in a natural form. But also labor force survey are very important, living standards survey, and specialized survey. Ideally, these all three sources could be combined. And for instance, administrative sources could be very rich data, could provide very rich data for comparison with household budget survey. And in some cases, we have quite good initiatives Then people simply collect these two data sets and get very good picture of situation on some uh, regions of the country. Well, all this data, you could say me, are imprecise. Of course, salary could be this and that in your country, in average, but somebody get less, somebody get more. Important thing that you never have to be absolutely sure about something. You should be reasonably certain. And that's enough. That gives you quite good understanding of a picture. And here comes proxy indicators. Every indicator is a proxy of something because it reflects reality indirectly, it's contextually linked, and it's quite dependent on contextual interpretation. Typically, it needs broader background, and typically it look only on part of the picture. For instance, could you judge about quality of life in your country just looking on wage statistics? Yes, it could give you a part of the picture, but it says nothing about unemployment. I mean, people who don't get wage. It says nothing about well-being of pensioners, people who don't get wage but get pension. So you could collect a lot of different things, a lot of different proxy indicators which could reflect your reality better. Here you could rely both on quantitative data, so-called hard statistics, but also on soft data, which are also quantifiable, which is qualitative data. Examples of proxies are very widespread, and I will take just only one, poverty. It's a very important problem, and there are a lot of debates about this. There are a lot of attempts to calculate uh, poverty level, and typically it requires household budget survey to collect data about consumption, then it requires a lot of job to set up poverty line, and then to calculate number of people who are living in poverty. However, you could easily face the issues. For instance, household budget survey is representative only on national level. You would like to know poverty level in your village or in your town. What can you do? Well, here comes a lot of good proxy indicators. One example is could be a food share of household expenditures. More poor household, more money it spent on food. That's general relation. So you could judge indirectly through food share of household expenditures about poverty in this region or in this country. You could also look on level of outstanding payments for that's uh, for electricity, for household utilities, and so on and so forth, for different categories of household, and make a judgment about their poverty level. You could also look on administrative data, for instance, a share of approved applications for bank loan, because it indirectly shows you number of people who are not eligible for bank loan because they are too poor according to the bank consideration. You could look on medical statistics, for instance, using of dental services, which is not basic good, but kind of advanced good, to which people turn when their basic needs are satisfied. You could also look on qualitative data, perception-based, and you could look, ask people, can you afford something like three meals uh, per day of meal with meat or fish if you need it, if you want it? or two pairs of food, uh, two pairs of footwear. And these things are supposed to be a standard, quality of life standard in your country. You could ask people if they could afford this, and if they could not afford, which, that means they are below minimum subsistence level in your country. Here we are coming to the conclusion of the first part of our lecture, and I would like to tell you about metadata. 
After saying these long stories about data sources, you could easily ask me, where could I get this understanding where this figure is coming from? That's metadata. It's data on data. Typically, metadata says clearly what, how data are defined, what methodology are used, how data are collected, when, by whom, what is periodicity of data collection, what is quality of data, uh, what is precise definition of this data. And these metadata are very, very important for your understanding what kind of data we are working with. Here we are coming to the question of human development indices. And I should say, essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. And human development indicators, composite human development indicators, are exactly an example of useful models, which could be partly wrong, but they are in use for more than 20 years and they prove to be quite useful. What is composite indices? What we are doing when we construct composite indices? Well, basically we aggregate information from different and directly incomparable areas. We take health, we take education, we take living standards, combine them together and calculate human development index. To do this, we index absolute values. So we have life expectancy as an indicator of health, which could range from 20 years to 85 years to 90 years, and we simply index it. We recalculate it into from absolute values to relative values. Next, we could weight the individual components to collect this index. Human development index family get birth in 1990, with human development index came to the scene. During these years, during these 12 years, it was a lot of attempts to improve this partially imperfect model and have something more useful. And now, in 2012, we have human development index family, which consists of a number of indicators. First of all is human development index. And this human development index show general average level of development, human development in the country. Second is inequality adjusted human development index. It catch all the differences between people in your country. You could say that one person in your country live in capital and he have much better health, education and uh, living standards than another person who is living in remote village with problems with access to education and so on and so forth. So inequality adjustment index catch these intra-country differences. Next comes gender indexes, which are gender related development index and gender inequality index. They try to do the same thing, but looking not on population in general, but two groups of population, women and men. It try to catch the difference between women human development and men human development. Last but not least, the index is multidimensional poverty index. It look on how many people face different deprivations and how, how big is a group of those who don't get to the minimum standard. Human development index is most well known index. It catch three areas of human development on which we have full agreement and nobody could criticize and say these are not important things. First dimension is long and healthy life and we look on this through life expectancy at birth. This indicator show us how long people who are born this year in our country expect to live. Next is knowledge. Knowledge is captured through two indicators. One indicator is current uh, achieved years of schooling and second indicator is forward looking. It's looking on years of schooling to be achieved by people who are currently living in our country. Third area is uh, decent standards of living. And here we judge by GNI per capita, gross national income per capita. That's much better than gross domestic product indicator which we used previously, because it ca capture transfers from country and to country as well. Next is inequality adjusted human development index. It follows the same logic. It looks on very same three areas of human development, health, knowledge, and distant standards of living, and use the very same 
indicators, life expectancy at birth, mean years of schooling, expected years of schooling, and GNI per capita. But it also looks on inequality, intra-country inequality in these three areas. It looks on differences in life expectancy at birth for different people in the country. It looks on different education achievement for different people in the country, and it looks on income inequality. To look on this, it use so-called Atkinson inequality measure, and then it penalize human development index for these uh, inequalities. So, in other words, we could interpret human development index as average potential achievement of the country in human development terms, and inequality adjusted human development index as a real achievement of country taking into account inequal unequal distribution of development outcomes between people. Picture shows, global picture shows that different countries have different levels of uh, inequality adjusted human development index. Inequality adjusted index show that different countries have shown different results in achieving this level of equality in human development. In each development group, high human development, medium human development, and low human development, we could find countries which have different level of inequality. And typically picture, which we, we see globally, more equal country, more developed countries. Here we cannot say about causality, because it's simple correlation, but we could see it quite clearly. More equal country, more developed countries. More developed countries, more equal it is. Okay, this model are useful, but are they right? Well, there are a lot of problems with human development index and with composite indexes in general. First of all, it's mix apples and oranges. It mix life expectancy and it mix years of schooling. It mix gross national income and it mix expected years of schooling. So it depends how much we put into this mixture. And that's the reason why not all indexes of human development were successful. If you look, it was a number of attempts to introduce different things which are important, like political freedoms, democracy, and so on and so forth. But these attempts was not so successful. Why? Because it became too complicated, too complex index. Second issue is selection of minimum and maximum values for indexation. And that could be not so easy task. Next question is data validity, especially for international comparisons. When we work on international level, it's very hard to compare countries because of very many local specialities. Age of entry to education system, what we consider to be part of education system. Shall we consider adult learning as a part of education system and so on and so forth. In this sense, international comparisons are quite hard. When you work on national level, it could be quite much easier to compare your country this year with your country five years ago, or to compare different regions of country, although also some questions about data validity comes to the scene. Next is interpretation of human development index. How we interpret the value of human development index? It has no physical meaning. It's certain index, how we could inter interpret its value. How we could interpret rank of country by human development index, because country could go up just because other countries nearby in table perform worse. So basically there is no progress, but we could see uh, this progress while other countries are sinking. On the other hand, it could be quite fast progress in country development, but we cannot see it from rank because neighbors in this table are performing much better. Next question, as we com collect and mix different areas, we could achieve same value of human development index through different ways. For instance, country could forget about education, forget about health, and concentrate on gross national income, which could give us quite high level of human development index, but exp at expense of other components. 
how could we judge which way is the best way? Last but not least question, which relates to previous one, is substitutability of components. If we have gain in one component of human development and loss in two comp to other components of human development, index in its current form allows certain sub substitutability, which means progress in one component could replace regress in two other components. Would we like to go this way? Next question comes, how we could measure multiple deprivation? That's index of multiple uh, multidimensional poverty index, which was introduced in 2010. What was the problem? Well, on one hand, development is a process of expanding of freedoms that people value and have reason to value. But our indicators of deprivation are limited. On one hand, that's poverty indicators. Typically, it's monetary, looking on incomes or expenditures. Human Development Index improved this. It brings income, but it also brings longevity, education attainment into this index. Next step was MDG, which looked on picture much broader. It had nutrition, it had health, it had education, it had certain uh, at a certain level, it get gender equality, broad environment. But also there is critical bottleneck. People also value things like safety, work, dignity, meaning. And even we have data available, the question is how we could aggregate this. That's, that's the purpose of multidimensional poverty index and Alkaya Foster methodology to combine all these things. In this methodology, we look on two deprivations, two kind of poverty lines. One is poverty line in each dimension, by which we judge if person is below or above poverty line in this particular dimension. That's very similar to income. When you set up poverty in income line, you look on minimum income below which you consider people as poor. You could have the same thing in area of job, if person have no secure job, or if person have no job at all, he is sort of poor in this dimension. That could go to security area, if people don't feel secure in their community, that's also poverty in security dimension. Second step is consolidation of this data. We could combine critical mass of this individual uh, vulnerabilities, and if person collects these individual vulnerabilities at, at, at some level, it's considered to be multidimensional poor. This multidimensional poverty index is one attempt to measure multidimensional um, poverty, but we used also another index, social exclusion index, and you could read about it in our uh, regional human development report. Last but not least, question is sustainability. We talked a lot of about development, but what is sustainability? What is ability to sustain this level of development? Unfortunately, we don't have index of sustainability, but we have a number of in indicators which are trying to address this issue. One is adjusted net savings proposed by World, World Bank. It's based on weak concept of sustainability and basically says we could substitute depletion of one component like natural, natural, natural resources, natural capital with accumulation of other resources like economic capital or human capital. It's take our GDP and then start penalizing for depletion of different capitals and then added accumulation of this capital. Another approach is ecological footprint, which is based on a completely different approach. It's strong concept of sustainability, which says, no, depletion of natural capital cannot be fully substituted by accumulation of economic and human potential. And ecological footprint try to estimate available natural resources of the country and resources country is using. And it show it in so-called global hectares available. These two indicators are used quite widely. Another example are 
particular environmental indicators which are looking on specific aspects of environmental sustainability and that could be carbon dioxide emission or uh, energy at intensity of GDP. But we have to work more on link between economic performance and energy consumption. We shall look more on sustainability indicator. And in your readings, you will find quite interesting paper produced in 2010 about correlation and disconnect between sustainability and human development indicators. Here I coming to one practical example of data and indicators use. Why it is important to use indicators? Why it is important to look on them? Why it is important to calculate from different groups? Well, with one foot in the bucket of ice water and one foot in the bucket of boiling water, on average you are comfortable. But you should also look on the differences. You should look on how things happen for different groups of people, how things happen for different conditions. And here's one example from our regional human development report on social exclusion. We looked on social exclusion chain, how different drivers of exclusion interact with individual characteristics we interpret as individual risks, how they interact with local conditions, and how they lead to outcome social exclusion. We simply looked on young people. And we find out that young people in our region face to a certain level of exclusion. We looked on most disadvantaged group. Young people, low education, living in village with only one company. And we find out predictably that they face very high risk of exclusion. But next we ask ourselves, what happens if we look on people who also live, who are also young, who are also living in this village, one employer, but what if we give them education? What if they have not low, but average level of education? And we find out that their situation improved. They face lower risk of exclusion. Then we start looking at local condition. Okay, what will happen if this village got vibrant uh, business environment? What if we have not only one big company, big coal horse, or as an enterprise which employs these people, but we have a multiple small businesses, small medium businesses. And we find out that level exclusion for these people is much lower even if they live in the village, even they have low education. What happens if they move to the town, move to the economic or center or capital? And we find out that Economic centers and capitals typically offer much more possibilities even for low educated people. You could feel it, you could evidence this from your examples because many countries of our region are exactly capital-based growth examples. And what happens if we combine all three factor, uh, factors, improvement of individual characteristics, i.e. getting better education, improvement of local conditions, i.e. vibrant business environment and improvement of local condition in terms that it's economic capital, uh, economic center or capital, you will find out that social exclusion level for these people is the lowest. With this example, let me finish and I am wishing you good reading of materials and good use of indexes. Thank you very much. <laughs>